Okay. Hey guys, uh, welcome to Blue Collar Catholic. Uh, I always tell my children, good things take time, great things happen all at once. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, I think we're for something great tonight. Uh, I spoke with uh, Father Vincent Lamport on Thursday. He agreed to come on our show and teach us about exorcisms and uh, spiritual warfare. And then on Saturday, I ordered his book, uh, Exorcism, The Battle Against Satan and His Demons. Uh, and I got to tell you, uh, Father, I uh, got this book on Easter when we came home from Mass. We went like 10 o'clock Mass, came home. I seen it. I wanted to read it so bad, but we had to rush and get to my daughter's uh, for uh, dinner. And we got home about 7 at night. I started reading this book, and I could not put it down. I read the entire book, uh, went to bed about 11 o'clock, and it was funny because the next day, uh, I get up, my alarm goes off at 3.30, and um, I'm at work, and one of the guys goes, man, I'm drinking. I was up drinking to midnight last night. And I go, man, I feel your pain. I was up to 11 o'clock reading the book. <laughs> 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 but... And, um, this book was so interesting. As you can see, I put a bunch of markers in there, but I took my highlighter and, like, from page one, I already highlighting. I mean, page one, verse one, I already got. These are things I like to talk to. Uh, and yesterday I went through it again and I kind of gleaned through it and looked at it. And I started thinking of all these other things. Uh, and then the second Bible, because we just get too crowded in there, got the uh, Catholic Catechism. Uh, but first, I have a, a ton of questions uh, uh, from a lot of friends and family, both Catholic Christians and Protestant Christians, uh, gave me a bunch of questions to ask. Uh, but I, I would just like to introduce Father Vincent. He's been a priest since now, one an ordained Catholic priest. Uh, and then he became a uh, authorized exorcist uh, in 2005. And um, for um, people that don't know me, I was an evangelical Protestant for three years. And, um, you know, reading Matthew uh, chapter 16, verses uh, 18 and 19, I believe, where Jesus said to Peter, You are Peter. I will build my church upon this rock. I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And God started leading me to the church history and, and, and um, just reading others. The only church that can trace all the way back to Jesus at that time is the Holy Catholic Church. And I realized gave the church. He didn't start churches. He started a church and gave that church authority. Now, I led me to of the church that Christ established, but I realized this church has power. And I mean, like I said, I love my evangelical brothers, and I had some great pastors that taught me the Word of God, but when things start flying and heads start spinning, I'm going to call a Catholic priest <laughs> because they have the authority. They have the authority authority if they are appointed by their bishop to use the ancient rite of exorcism and tonight we're going to talk to a man of god who's used this ancient rite of exorcism and um so i just want to welcome you father and um if you want to say a few words quickly and then i'll get right into the questions because i know people are really uh really interested in this subject <laughs> I would just say it's good to be with you this evening. Thank you know, you. there are many exorcists that are uh, not publicly known, but I think I've thrown my name out in the public forum as an opportunity for people to know where to go with questions that they may have. Certainly, I can't minister to everybody who contacts me, but I want to help connect people with priests in their area who are trained to be able to help them because when people suffer, nobody should really have to suffer alone. And it's the role of the church to be able to reach out to these folks and provide them with the help that they need. That's what I, I noticed in your book. Uh, again, I highly recommend this book. You guys really need 
to get this book, uh, Exorcism, the, the Battle Against Satan and His Demons. What I noticed in the book, I was kind of surprised, but I guess I shouldn't have been, was the way you talk about God's unconditional love for us, his compassion, his mercy, his grace. And you always think in terms of warfare, like fighting and hard. And uh, I do, I guess, you know, but, you know, I kind of grew up in a rough neighborhood and you always kind of relate things to a fight. Um, but you just opened my eyes to that, of course, love never fails and God is love. I mean, you didn't say that you didn't put it in those terms, but that's what I got from everything you mm -hmm. were saying. And uh, on that note, I, I just I want to ask you if you could just say a few words to the people I've told, like I said, a lot of my friends and family are Catholic Christians uh, and a lot more are Protestant Christians. And but most of them, whether they were Protestant or Catholic, they all love the Lord. But when I told them I was going to speak with an exorcist, they all got like this scared look on their face. And a lot of them didn't even want to talk about it. My mom, I call her every night on the way home, see how she's doing on my way home from work. We usually talk halfway home. And usually I got to tell her like five times, I got to go. And she just keeps talking right through me. But, uh, <laughs> The other night, Thursday night, I'm coming home. I said, Ma, you're not going to believe this. I spoke to an exorcist, and he's going to come on my show. It's like, okay, honey, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even exaggerating one bit. And if you knew my mom, people that are watching, they know my mom. They're laughing right now. Uh, I said, what's the matter? Are you okay? She goes, no, I'm good. Uh, and then I realized I got that same reaction from a lot of people. So could you just give a word to tell people that, you know, People that love God, we don't need to be afraid. Why don't we need to be afraid? Yeah, we do. Have, you know, the more that we understand about the devil, the more we come to realize that he's nothing to fear. I think there's a lot of people who believe that God and the devil are on the same playing field. And, you know, the devil is still a creature of God, and there's no way a creature can be greater than the creator. And in the role in the ministry of exorcism, it really is all about unmasking the devil, because when we unmask him, we drag him out into the light, the light of Christ. Then we see him for who he truly is. And once we see him for who he truly is, there's really nothing to fear about the devil. You know, the devil will play on people's memories, play on people's imaginations. So if we're afraid, we've already given the devil a foothold in our lives. And as a people of faith, who believe in God and trust in God and recognize that God is love, the devil is nothing to fear. Amen. Amen. So let me ask you this. Uh, as a fight fan, we always try to guess who's the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter that ever fought. <laughs> so who would you say is the best pound-for-pound -pound angel that we have on our side? A powerful <laughs> angel. <laughs> Michael, St. Michael, the archangel. Uh, would you agree with that? Michael is the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter. Yes, you know, well, the name Michael, you know, is a name that means who is like God. So when Lucifer was rebelling against God, it was the archangel Gabriel who spoke up, basically saying, how dare you compare yourself to God or want to be God? And so the Catholic Church has always recognized St. Michael as a powerful defender. We even have the St. Michael prayer that was given to us uh, by Pope Leo back at the end of the uh, 20th century the uh, 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. So St. Michael the Archangel is a powerful ally in our battle against the devil. The weakest angel in heaven be able to defeat the strongest demon from hell? Absolutely, and the reason is because uh, angels are perfect creatures. They chose, you know, the story of creation, God created the angelic world, gave them free will like he gave us, and then asked the angels, would they use their free will and unite their wills with God? And from the book of Revelation, we know that Lucifer, along with one third of the angels, chose to rebel against God and not unite their wills with God, but two thirds did. And so we always have to remember there are more on our side than those who are against us. And so an angel that has united its will with the will of God is a perfect creature. So there really, is, it's a no contest when it comes to the good angels battling uh, Satan and his demons. Okay, so now that we have all my friends and family at ease, um, <laughs> <laughs> I 
what's what's the strangest most bizarre thing that you've ever seen uh either doing a exorcism or i know that you were trained and you observed like 40 exorcisms in rome um what would be one of the most bizarre things for being supernatural yeah you know when i was uh i trained in rome in 2006 so i had a franciscan priest who allowed me to apprentice under him during the three months i was in rome so i was able to participate in 40 exorcisms over there, and then learn firsthand the church's ministry to those up against the forces of evil and who are seeking the help of the church. An exorcism that I performed uh, returning to the States here in Indiana, when I commanded the demon to uh, name itself, seven voices came out of the person's mouth at the same time. Oh. So if you can even imagine, but you talked earlier about the, the authority and when demons are commanded in the name of Jesus Christ to do something, they must do it. Because even though they reject God, they still know who God is. You know, even in scriptures, the demons would say to Jesus, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. So they, they recognize Jesus for who he truly is. It's just that they reject him. But they still know him for his power, and so they have to obey the authority. So in this particular case, there were seven demons that named themselves. Usually when a person is possessed, it's not a question of one demon. There's always multiple demons that are present. When the angels fell and we got the demonic world, they fell from the different choirs. And so there is a hierarchy within the demonic world as well, just as much as there is a hierarchy in the angelic world. So demons that are more powerful kind of commandeer a cluster of demons, if you will. It's not that they have any love for each other. They're just united in their hatred for humanity. And working with this particular person, the weakest demons are always the first to go. They, they cannot resist and put up much of a fight at all. But there was one particular demon that was the last to go. It was the one who told me that its name was Leviathan, a demon mentioned in the Bible and the great sea monster. And Leviathan said it did not have to leave since it had been invited in. But in an exorcism, a demon is commanded to literally return that which it has stolen, namely a person created in the image and likeness of God. And because the human person is God's greatest creation, because we reflect the, the divine image, then a person who wants to renounce whatever they did to open up the entry point for the demonic into their life the demons have to obey because we can grow in our understanding you know maybe at one time in our lives we made a poor choice but we have free will we can change we can convert and get back on the path of god a demon would, would try to convince us no strike one and you're out which is why the demon told me it did not have to leave because the person had invited it in but again we can grow in holiness we can grow in virtue we can repent acknowledge our sinfulness and make a return to God and demons have to obey that. That's interesting because one of my questions you already you just answered, uh, my daughter-in-law asked me how come demons can't repent? I guess that's why once they make a decision, they, they can't change, they can't, they can't grow ever. Like what they, I think what you said in your book is a program more or less like a computer and what they have is what they have. They can't grow and change like us. You know, I was a sinner, you know, I'm still a sinner saved by grace, but I was mm -hmm. living a life of sin as a teenager. And then I had an experience with the grace of God in boot camp. You're saying, <laughs> <a devil. laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's no atheist in boot camp. <laughs> at least while you're getting yelled at, you're like, God, help me. <laughs> but um, it's, it's really the nature of an angelic creature. So god created angels and gave them infused knowledge so there's no longer any learning that needs to be done even saint thomas aquinas referred to that as evening knowledge the knowledge of things in the natural order and then god says to the angels will you now take the knowledge that i've given you and use that knowledge to glorify me and then he called that accepting things according to the divine order according to god's plan as morning knowledge. And it's based on the story of creation. It was always evening came and morning followed the new day. 
So demons that received evening knowledge and then rejected God are imperfect creatures. And then angels that receive the infused knowledge and then embrace God's plan for them. You know, why are angels always depicted with wings? You know, they're purely spiritual creatures. They don't have bodies as we have. But angels have always been depicted with wings because they have united their will to the will of God. And wings show their readiness to always implement the will of God quicker than you can snap your fingers. Wow, that's interesting. I never, I never knew that. That's very interesting. Um, so I have a lot of questions. We'll try to get to them all. I promised my uh, <laughs> subscribers, uh, just put the comment, and my friends, I promised them. Um, one thing a lot of people ask is how do you rule mental illness? Yeah, so we, we exorcists have always used a protocol. So we always require someone to have some type of a mental uh, evaluation, some type of psychological evaluation. So the church wants experts in the mental health field to weigh in on the situation. The church would also require someone to go see their family doctor to rule out any other physical cause. It's important to note that the church is not asking the psychiatrist or the family doctor, do you think this person is possessed? The church herself will always make that determination, but the church wants to make the best determination in having these experts weigh in on a particular case allows me to reach the conclusion beyond any reasonable doubt that the person in front of me is truly dealing with the demonic. And percentage by that, I don't know if you know the exact percentage of your guests being experienced with this percentage of people that come to you thinking they're possessed, but they're actually have a mental illness. Well, I can tell you probably 99% of the people that contact me have already self-diagnosed. They believe they're possessed, they're dealing with the demonic, and they need an exorcism. But exorcists are trained to be skeptics. So I should be the last one in the room to believe that somebody's truly possessed. Every other possible explanation has to be exhausted, which again is why the church requires the psychiatric evaluation, the uh, medical examination. And then I would actually sit down with the person and go through a series of questions to determine if this is truly demonic, then what was the entry point for the demonic into the person's life? So what did the person do either directly or indirectly that divided the, the, uh, the demon in. And then my goal would be to help resume the person's spiritual life or to help that person for the very first time to um, establish that relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, about half the people I work with are Catholic. The other half come from other Christian faith traditions. Some come from other world religions. Some come from no religious background whatsoever. The church will always want to help anyone who believes they're dealing with the demonic because the church views exorcism as a ministry of charity. But even with that said, people have to realize the church may come to the conclusion that what the person is dealing with is not truly demonic, but of a mental health issue. And I can tell you firsthand that when people are self-diagnosed, if I tell them that it's my judgment based on all the steps that we've gone through, that this is not something demonic, then people don't uh, willingly accept that. And sadly, there are many people today uh, who have no faith background whatsoever, but call themselves professional exorcists who prey on a lot of people who are suffering out there. You know, I worked with a gentleman one time in another state, and uh, I told him it was my judgment that it was not demonic, but of a mental health issue. It was even working to get him connected with a counselor but he was convinced that it was demonic, reached out to a professional exorcist who told him that he was possessed by five demons and he was gonna charge him $1,500 each oh. to expel them. That's a sad case of somebody preying on somebody's brokenness just to make a buck. That's very sad. That is very sad. Next question that I have is uh, kind of, with the first one, have you ever seen anyone levitate or uh, speak in other languages that they didn't know? 
Yeah, so the, the church looks identifies four things that I should look for to determine if somebody is truly possessed. Number one would be the ability to speak and understand languages unknown to the person. And why could a demon speak another language? It goes back to that evening knowledge that we talked about. Demons don't have to go to school to learn a language. They can just call it up. So that would be an indication, uh, speaking a language otherwise unknown to the individual, superhuman strength, having elevated perception, knowledge about things that a person should not otherwise know, and then an aversion to anything of a sacred nature, such as being blessed with holy water, being shown a crucifix, having a Bible perhaps placed on your head during a prayer. So, so if something of a religious nature creates a very negative reaction, that could be a sign of a demonic presence. You know, the demons don't want to be cast out, so they will do anything to try to instill fear in either myself or anyone who's present for an exorcism. So I have witnessed many different manifestations, such as levitation, people speaking in other languages, eyes rolled in the back of the head, foaming at the mouth. I've seen people drop on the floor and, and start to crawl and slither around like a snake. Again, these are all tricks of the devil who wants to divert from the prayer of the church and the focus on God. He's basically like a kid throwing a temper tantrum saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. And in the years that I've done the ministry, I've learned really not to pay any attention to what the devil is doing. I want to stay focused on the power of God that is present in this particular prayer of the church. Amen. Amen. I had um, actually, um, I had heard that the uh, movie about Emily Rose was pretty accurate. And I Googled on YouTube an audio of the actual uh, exorcism where she spoke in several languages, I believe it was Aramaic, Latin, Greek, like all the Hebrew, all these ancient languages. And mm -hmm. her said, I believe her only language that she knew was German, I think was her native tongue, or mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. And um, to me, it was very convincing. I didn't see the, the uh, video, but I actually heard the audio and I seen pictures of her. And to me, it was very convincing. And uh, you know, I, I let people hear it, and I still had skeptics. And and you said something very interesting in your book. For us who who know God, believing is seeing, but mm -hmm. for the unbeliever, seeing is believing. You know, these people have to see this a lot of times, and even sometimes when they see it, they still deny. Do you have a lot of people like when you deal with uh, family members that they don't believe it, or they normally realize, hey, this is, this is my sister. She doesn't know these seven languages. She mm -hmm. must be. And do you think that was accurate, the Emily Rose movie? So I, that was a bunch of my questions. <laughs> the movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, is pretty authentic okay. when it comes to what an exorcism actually looks like and what the church is dealing with with somebody who is possessed. So it's a pretty accurate account of what actually takes place. I will say again that I think there's more people that are fascinated about what the devil is doing rather than what God is doing. I jokingly tell people that if you're going to give a talk on Jesus, about 20 people will show up. But if you're going to give a talk on the devil, 200 people will show up. There's always that fascination with the devil. And it reminds me of an old song, and I don't remember who sings it, but the line that goes, I know there ain't no heaven, but I pray there ain't no hell. Yeah, blood, blood, and tears. <laughs> there, there, that's it. There you go. Yeah, that's right. But there's always that fascination that with the devil. You look at TV today. There are so many programs about the devil and evil, and I don't know what it is, but there, people just seem to have a great fascination with it. And people will look at me in disbelief as an exorcist when I tell them, I'm really not interested in what the devil is doing. My role is to help people to see the face of God. Amen. So I'm really not interested in what the devil is doing. That's awesome. I like that. That is awesome. People are fascinated. Uh, you know, you look at the popularity of uh, witchcraft. I in Central Florida, I uh, had a delivery in a town. Called, uh, I forget the name, but it's about an hour Central Florida. But the town is known for spiritualism, and it became a tourist. It became a tourist area. I can't remember the name of the town, but I was in there. I just feel like I could just sense like an evil spirit. I had to make a delivery to a little convenience store, and it just. Just in your sense, there was, there was a spirit there. I felt like it was a demonic spirit. 
and um, you're right. People are, people come there like a tourist. It's like a tourist thing. They go to Disney and they go to this town. Um, so, what would you tell people that are interested just for fun? I think it's fun to you know be bored or to go to. Uh, because I was going to say, people need to realize that they may think they're dealing with something that's fun and entertaining. But the danger is that people could be opening up an entry point for the demonic into their lives. You know, demons aren't like, you know, an amusement ride or an, an attraction that you can go to and you think you can just leave and you leave it behind. Demons are looking for a connection with us to destroy us. So when people open up an entry point to evil, sometimes people do that directly when they're engaged in things they know they shouldn't be doing you know, based on what the Bible tells us about how we're called to conduct our lives, you know, in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament about not practicing magic and trying to communicate with the dead and going to see psychics and medians. All of those practices are condemned in chapter 18 of the book of Deuteronomy because they're a violation of the first commandment that says we should look for no substitute for God. And when people are turning to magic and in all these types of things, they're, they're looking for a replacement for God. You know, the Israelites did that with the golden calf. We do that today on many, many ways. But the number one thing we're called to do is give God his rightful place in our lives. And when we sin, call sin a sin and repent and make a return to God. And God is always ready to forgive because God is love. We just celebrated that with Easter. God's Amen. greatest, you know, example of his love for us is Jesus on the cross. And we're just called to accept that. And when we we trip up, own it, own it. I, you know, I tell people here in my parish, you know, you read about the story of Adam and Eve in the fall of humanity, you know, when God went looking for Adam, Adam, where are you? You know, and he's like, and he's hiding from God as if he could hide from God. And of course, God knew where he was, but how did he respond? Well, the woman made me do it. And I always think, what would have happened if Adam simply said to God, I sinned and I'm sorry? If God, we truly believe God is love and about forgiveness and mercy, how could God not have responded in a forgiving manner? But because we always wanted to point the finger, you know, Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent and we're pointing fingers at each other when all we're called to do is repent. But I think the danger today is that there's a lot of people that have lost the sense of sin. We try to justify everything rather than just saying, you know what? I've done wrong here, and I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and you even pointed it out in your book, uh, uh, basically, where you said, um, you said, well, I don't know where it is, <laughs> but I know I got it high. But basically, you said uh, even the murder of unborn children, we justify like it's nothing. And we have a society that ha doesn't even give dignity to, to a baby. What do we expect? And I think you went on to say like 51% of uh, young people that they don't even belong to a church. Is that a Pew Center research uh, study? Thing? Even higher what than that. It's it's oh. a 78% of people that grew up in traditional Christian households now say they're no longer, uh, they no longer believe in God. They, they claim oh. to be atheist. You know, oh. I think, and that's where in my book, I point out that there's people living by three guiding principles today. You may do whatever you wish. Nobody has the right to command you, and you're the God of yourself. You know, that was the temptation of the serpent to Eve. You know, did God say not to do that? You know, eat. You're going to become God. You're going to be like gods. So the human person, we've been trying, we've been playing the devil's game because we're trying to take the place of God. You know, the devil tried to do that. We tried to do that today. And in doing so, we try to justify everything, including abortion. You know, oftentimes people ask the question, well, why is the devil so interested in possessing a human person? And the answer is at the very core of our Christian beliefs. The greatest thing that God ever did for us is the incarnation. God took on human form in the person of Jesus Christ to show us his love for us. And the devil believes that he has his own twisted form of the incarnation when he takes on possession, when he possesses a human person. But Christ, you know, God took on human form to show us his love for humanity. The devil takes on human form 
to distort the image of God. Again, because the human person were created in the image and likeness of God. So, the devil copies God, what God means for good, the devil always copies and uses for evil. That's right, because the devil, I mean, his goal is the destruction of humanity. You know, our, we're on a journey right now. You know, we're trying to find the tree of life again since they've been expelled from paradise. And Jesus so, says the tree of life is right here. There's Jesus on the cross. That's the tree of life because he's opened for us the, the gates of heaven, the pathway to eternal life. But the devil is trying to distract us from that journey. You know, very, very in the book of Genesis, there's the banishment from the Garden of Eden and being prevented to approach the tree of life. And they're in the in Revel, the book of Revelation, where they're at the very end. It's the tree of life. You know, and Jesus is saying he's it. You know, in John's gospel, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the gateway to the tree of life and to be with God forever in his heavenly kingdom. The devil wants to trip us up on that journey. The devil believes that if he can destroy the church, then he will destroy the path that God has given to us to return. Amen. That was, I, I, and I've never heard it put that way. I actually highlighted, like I said, as soon as I started reading this book, I started highlighting. It says, <laughs> one of my favorite definitions of the church is that it is the guardian of the tree of life. And I was like, wow, that is beautiful. And uh, yes, yeah, that's a, that's an amazing thing to think about the church that way. That's that's beautiful. And and that, and like you were saying, the devil always uh, mimics God for evil. One of my questions, uh, uh, a good friend of mine had asked, was about the witching hour at three a.m. And he said, "Does that is that supposed to copy or uh, uh, kind of uh, blaspheme?" The resurrection because tradition holds that christ was resurrected at 3 p.m is there anything to that and, and that is the that is the belief that three o'clock when christ you know is on the cross and he dies that that's that's the moment of christ now the devil again he wants to have his moment if you will and so it's always the opposite so 3 a.m has always been considered the bewitching hour or the hour of the devil whereas three o'clock is the hour of Christ. Wow, interesting. And the same, uh, the same brother also tell if you the demon as opposed to a soul of purgatory, the difference. Yeah, so de demons are fallen angels. So those are in the book of Revelation where it says, that the serpent's tail swept one third of the stars out of the sky. That's a reference to, you know, star or angels are considered to be creatures of light intelligence. So there's always that notion of light, but his tail meaning when he chose to rebel against God, Lucifer's decision reverberated through all nine choirs of the angels and one third of the angels embraced his rejection of God. It's the notion in the angelic world those closest to the uh, throne of God, God's glory, will illumine those in the lower choir. And of course, Lucifer was closest to God's glory. And when he chose to uh, reject God, then that you could say his choice went through all nine choirs and one third of the angels embraced that and then fell. So demons are fallen angels. Now, we know that when we die, there is a sense that we're going to be judged. And that would be, uh, you know, the notion, you know, based on uh, the book of Hebrews, where it says that not all sins are deadly. It's the notion, even kind of reflecting on Pope Benedict. You know, there's a book that Pope Benedict comments on, and it's, I've always found it very powerful. He said that he believes that purgatory is the person of Jesus Christ. It's not a place, but it's about being purged of our sins. And he says that no stain of sin can enter into the presence of God the Father because God is perfect and no imperfection. So Jesus Christ is the one who purifies us. He becomes the purifying flame, if you will. So the sins that don't merit eternal damnation, Christ is the one who cleanses us of those sins. Based on John's gospel again, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father but through me. So we have to pass through Christ. He purifies us of the sins that don't merit e eternal damnation. But then you could say that those that do, Christ becomes the all-consuming flame. Wow. And there's, there's eternal damnation. But we should never think of purgatory as a place. It really is a process. It's the acknowledgement that not all sins are deadly, but even those non-deadly sins have to be dealt with because we can't enter into the presence of God the Father with any stain of sin. The line in scripture, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So no imperfection can be in the presence of God. And Christ is the one who purifies us to be with God forever in heaven. Amen, amen. It's a great teaching on purgatory. Um, I think what this brother may have been referring to, and you refer to it in your book, that for some reason, a small percentage of souls God allows to stay uh, on this earth, maybe to reconcile something. You talked about a, a man who had terminal cancer mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he just went through a divorce and he was trying to reconcile things with his wife and, and God allowed him to stay. So maybe he's saying that like a, like a yeah. human soul hasn't left the earth. How would you know it's that opposed to a demon? And I think I know the answer because I read your book, but I don't want to give it away. <laughs> you could say it much better, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I would say that there are some cases where it does seem that God permits the soul of one who has died to still be present in this reality. But it's what God is permitting. Once we die, we cannot choose to act in this reality. So it's what God is permitting. And... My experience over the years is that I've, I've encountered people that were experiencing some type of spiritual presence and it wasn't demonic. And I believe that there's kind of an innate sense that lets us know whether something is evil or if it's not evil. You know, it reminds me of St. Augustine in his writings where he says, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in you. You know, the human person, we have the innate desire for God because we reflect the divine image. So when people encounter a soul of one who has died, they're not afraid. You know, in, they may see lights going on and off. They hear footsteps and things are moving about, but it's not terrifying. And I think that's kind of the sense that God lets us know that this is a soul that's seeking prayers, that it's not something of a demonic nature. Because it is true that sometimes demons will, will try to mimic the souls of those who have died as a way to lure people in. And so, but in those cases, I think God gives us that inner sense to know, hey, this is something evil. It's not good. It needs to be rejected and we need to get away from it. But when it's the soul of one who has died, I think we have a sense of peace or calmness about us. And the best thing to do for those souls is as Catholics, we would have a mass said for them. We would pray for them. And my experience is that in a short period of time, praying for those who have died, all these manifestations of that spirit cease. And that soul then is able to go and find the eternal peace to which God is calling it. Very interesting. Um, man, I'm, I'm just... As you talk, more questions come in. I've, I've barely got to like uh, one twentieth of the question I got. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just fascinated. Uh, so, one of my subscribers said her daughter was approved uh, for an exorcism by her, and it's been over a year, and um, she's wondering what's taken so long. Would you, does that seem too long to you, or is that? you know, something that's usually happens, it takes a while. Well, I would say that God always determines the time of deliverance. So okay. we're in an exorcism, we're always operating on God's time. Well, actually, they, they haven't started the exorcism yet. She's wondering, okay. that, I'm sorry, they, they haven't started it. So do you think they're still investigating it? She said in, in the comments, she said it was approved, but no action has been taken. Yeah. So I, my guess is that they're, they're getting ready to, to follow the process. People need to understand that it's the local bishop that is the exorcist in his diocese. And the church always want to have 
moral certitude, meaning beyond a doubt to believe that a person is possessed. Okay. So in this case, if it's been approved, then that must have been validated. And now it's a matter of moving forward with the official right of the church. And I will want to point out that in an exorcism, you know, an exorcism at its very core is a prayer. So even if people feel like they're afflicted and they think they need an exorcism, you know, there are other things that can be done before that. You know, go and talk to your priest or your pastor of your church. Have that person pray with you. You know, that can be done without any lengthy investigation. You know, as Catholics, we can go to the sacrament of reconciliation. We can ask for the anointing of the sick. So it, always, it doesn't always have to be exorcism or nothing. There are things that we can be doing in the interim that can help us grow in holiness and virtue. Because people oftentimes get frustrated. They think, I need an exorcism and I need it today. But the church, again, wants to move very cautiously. And I would say that the church would do greater danger and harm if it labels someone as being possessed and that label prevents the person from getting the true help that they need either from their medical doctor or from the mental health expert. But even if somebody is struggling and it's uncertain what it is, pray with that person. Don't be afraid to do that. You know, there's a danger today. I think a lot of ministers in many faith traditions, somebody mentions that they're dealing with the devil. The phone gets hung up. The doors are closed in their face. Absolutely. Calls are not returned. Absolutely. Listen to the people and, yeah, and let them know, well, we don't know what it is right now, but I'm going to pray with you. You know, that doesn't take anything to pray with somebody. And it's a very powerful thing because, again, Jesus is not a bystander in an exorcism. He's the main actor. And I tell people that if they're relying on me and my power, we are all in trouble. <laughs> but if we're, if we're relying on the power of Jesus Christ that is present in his church and in his minister, that's where they need to be. And I will say that I've seen a growing trend today, especially because we're living in an age when faith is in decline, that there's a lot of people that are turning to the church, but they believe the priest is a, is a magician, that I have power and I have a bag of tricks with holy water and a crucifix and rattle off some words in Latin, and the power is there. No, the power is in Jesus Christ, and everything that we're doing should point to him, and the minister himself should point to Christ. Because if I make it about me, I'm in trouble. Even the priest in Rome who trained me told me the very last thing when I was leaving, he said, if you're ever doing an exorcism and you say to yourself, wow, look at what I'm doing. He said, you just treaded on unholy ground. Because he goes, you as a person cannot go up against the power of evil. You need to take the power of Christ and his authority with you and the devil will be defeated every time. Now, going back to your question about why is it taking so long? You know, I, I was thinking about, in some cases, people will ask, why does an exorcism prayer need to be repeated? Jesus says, gives the command once and it's gone. And my experience has been, I always give the comparison between exorcisms and what I would call the pagan world, meaning where a person has not heard the good news of Jesus Christ, and that person is possessed. In those cases, an exorcism is one and done. But in the apostate world, especially here in the Western world, you know, Christianity built Western civilization. And here in the Western world, when people knew the good news of Jesus Christ and they walked away from it, and now they're possessed, evil tends to have a greater claim on these people because they knew the truth, they embraced it and then they rejected it. And it does seem that, de that demons have more of a grip on these people. And when an exorcism is taking longer than it should, then my experience is there's still something that the person is holding on to, something that they've not confessed or revealed, and that's giving the demon that continued, I don't know, grip or hook on that person. Because in an exorcism, the church is not there to judge anybody for why the possession took place. The church wants to help the person, but the church can only help when people are forthright. It would be like going to your doctor, knowing that something is wrong, but you're embarrassed to say something to your doctor. People cannot be embarrassed because the church is not there to judge the person. The church wants to help the person, 
but the more information I have allows me to know the best way to give the person the help that they need. Awesome. Um, can music be a gateway? I remember when I was uh, a young evangelical, I watched a movie called uh, Rock and Roll in Search of God, and they showed the mask masking of one of my favorite bands when I was younger, Led Zeppelin, and it uh, quoted scripture, blasphemed God, and the uh, host of that movie, I think it's on YouTube now, I have a VHS tape at the time, the host said that it was impossible for that type of back masking because um, Robert Plant, the singer of the band, was saying something, saying something, and those same exact words backwards were being uh, enunciated clearly and blaspheming God. So if it was just accidental, it would say something like pig lay eggs or something. But mm -hmm. every case he was saying, it was saying a clear uh, indication. Uh, that it was something evil. So uh, this was actually my daughter-in-law asked me this question. She wanted to know, uh, can God use, uh, forgive me, could the devil use music as a gateway into someone? And while we're on it, what are some of the other gateways that we need to look out for? Yeah, I would put music in what I would call the entertainment industry, that that could be an avenue because it creates a fas fascination with evil. So whether it's through music, certain types of literature, television shows, computer gadgets, look at a lot of these games that, um, that people are playing. You know, the devil is very subtle. He wants to get his grip on us. You know, very few people is just gonna come out and like, boom, here I am, so to speak. But he wants to gradually kind of get into our heads. And I think he does that through music, does it through literature. But his goal is to get us to uh, to reject God. And I think a lot of that has happened, especially with people in the entertainment industry. It's almost like there's a rejection of God. You know, it's about glorifying themselves or it's about power and prestige. It's about money. But I'm reminded again of John 330, where John the Baptist says, you know, he must increase and I must decrease. But there's a lot of people in the in, in the entertainment industry that are trying to get us to increase ourselves and decrease God. That's why God is being blasphemed, because again, it's about removing God from the picture. And when God is removed from the picture, you know, humanity is going to collapse. And I think that's what the devil is trying to do. You know, other entry points for the demonic that I've seen, so the entertainment industry, the occult, you know, where people are engaged in magic, I tell people, all magic is inherently evil. And I don't mean an illusionist that's pulling a rabbit out of a hat or things like that, but magic at its very core that's trying to control and manipulate people. So again, magic at its core is inherently evil. Those practices are all condemned. You know, when people engage in things that they believe are fun and entertaining, you know, people that read their horoscopes and all of that, you know, they start relying on these things. I mean, I even tell people, you know, like, have you ever knocked on wood? Now, just because somebody's done that, I don't think they're possessed. But it's an example of how things that are of an evil nature have a grip on us and we don't even realize it. You know, where does knocking on wood come from? It's a druid practice. It's a belief that spirits live in the trees. And when you knock on wood, you're asking the spirit that lives in the tree to come to your aid and grant what you want or what you wish. Oh, now, the average person probably doesn't know that, but that's an example of how something that I would say has its root in evil has, has its grip on us and we don't even know it. Wow. So listening to you and, you know, reading your book twice, <laughs> <laughs> it's in, uh, I'm no expert, so this is why I'm asking you. It seems like there's laws like... Um, spiritual laws that you have to follow you just can't go in there and you know and just start screaming i rebuke you satan in the name of jesus you, there's spiritual laws it seems to me like i said i'm just this is how i'm perceiving it and you're like a spiritual lawyer for the church uh so you have to follow spiritual laws and and, and um so my question is 
does the person always have to invite a demon in to be possessed? Or can the demon trick them? And then you, like on a technicality, say, I don't know, does that make sense? And, and what would you say to that? Yeah, I think people can invite a demon in and become possessed either directly or indirectly. So directly, when somebody is engaged in something they know is contrary to the laws of God, but they choose to do it anyway. Okay. So when you, when you know you're doing something wrong, when you're involved in the occult or you're practicing satanic rituals. I mean, I, I, I talked to an elderly man one time who was dying and his family asked me to talk with him. And he, he told me, he said, Father, I know my family is concerned about me, but he goes, it's my desire when I die to spend eternity with the demons that I befriended in this life. He goes, I do not want to be with God for all eternity. Oh. And I'm listening to this in like disbelief, like, oh. but that was, he told me he wanted to spend eternity with the devil and his demons. Wow. He's so and the family's like, what do we do? And I'm like, well, he has free will, but I go, we can continue to pray for him that he has a change of heart. You know, it's never too late. As long as we have a breath in our body, you think of the good thief on the cross. Amen. At that Amen. moment, Jesus didn't say, let's recap everything you did wrong. He just said, this day you're going to be with me in paradise. Amen. If that's not an example of God's great love, then I don't know what is. But that's man. That, yeah, he said he didn't want anything to do with God. But people can also invite God in or invite a demon in indirectly when they're involved in things they think are entertaining. You know, for example, playing with a Ouija board. Now, you play with it once and you're whatever is no big deal. But people start having a reliance on that. And you know, the power behind that is the power of evil. So that when people do things directly and indirectly, and demons are very legalistic. So just because somebody thinks they're doing something, I had somebody tell me one time, they were at, went to one of these ghost hunting shows and encountered a, a demon and they were leaving and they're like, okay, whatever you are, I'm leaving now. Don't come home with me. <laughs> you stay here and I'm leaving. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> because, you know, demons as pure spirits, we say, are neither here nor there. We say they're here or there if they're choosing to act in a location. So if we're given a demon an excuse to manifest in our lives because of something we've done, either directly or indirectly, they're going to latch onto that. Um, and then again, that's why the church is very methodical in the process that it uses to combat a demon. So there is a ritual, it's a liturgical rite. Now I will say the Catholic Church doesn't have a monopoly on exorcism ministry, but because it is a liturgical rite, we have a prescribed way that it's done, if you will. Okay. But to me, the most powerful thing in an exorcism is the presence of God in that moment of prayer. So a person doing an exorcism needs to be a man or a woman of God. You know, I always think of pictures of saints. When you see a picture of a saint, what's around their head? It's a halo. It's not their glory they're radiating. They're radiating the glory of God so much that they unite their will with God's will. So you think of Lucifer again before the fall, closest to the throne of God. Lucifer is a name that means lighted one. He was literally absorbing God's glory exponentially. But then when he rejected God, he's now associated with darkness. I tell people, you know, I have eight brothers and sisters. Six of them are brothers. <laughs> My brothers and I, when we were kids, we always got these glow-in-the-dark balls. We put them up by the lamp, and then we turn the light off in the room, and it would glow. Well, the glow is not the glow of the ball. It's the light that it absorbed. And because the devil has rejected God, he's no longer absorbing God's glory, if you will. So he's now in eternal darkness. Saints, which we're all called to be, we're called to absorb God's glory by being holy and righteous and virtuous and God-fearing. And it goes back to what you were alluding to earlier. If you are a Catholic, if you're going to Mass, if you're praying, if you're reading the Word of God, if you're celebrating the sacraments, the devil is already on the run. You know, and if you're not a Catholic, but you're a faith-filled Christian person, if you're going to church and you're reading the Word of God and you're God-fearing, you don't have we don't have anything to worry about. Amen. You know, That's we awesome. put on the armor of Christ 
Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We don't have anything to fear. Psalm 91, I need not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. When we know that we are in God's camp, we have nothing to fear whatsoever, not even the devil himself. Amen, amen. But I'm glad I'm Catholic now because we have a little bit more than I, than I had when I was an, when I was an evangelical. I had my Bible alone, and you're right. There's a lot of faith-filled brothers and sisters in our, you know, our separated brethren, the evangelicals. But I'm very thankful for our church. You know, I read in the Book of Acts how people used to take St. Paul's handkerchief and bring it to demon yeah. possessed family members and the demons would run, bring it to sick people, and they would be healed. And then I'm reminded of the sacraments we have, the holy water, the crucifix. And, um, you know, I think it was Scott Hahn, Dr. Scott Hahn, who said, being Catholic means there's always something you can do. You never <laughs> run out of hope. <laughs> I, I always tell people that our Catholic faith is the three-legged stool. It's the Word of God. It's the Bible. It's tradition with the capital T, and it's the magisterium. It's the authority. So it's those three legs that the church is built on. And you, if you have a stool, three-legged stool, and one of them falls off, what's going to happen to the stool? It's going to collapse. So again, we need the Word of God. We need the Bible. We need the tradition of the church, and we need the magisterium. We need that authority. And that's going to give us a solid foundation on which to make our journey through this life to the tree of life. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I just have uh, one more question someone asked me, and then I have a, a question for myself I wanted to talk about. Um, so someone this commented, uh, her and her husband are new converts to the Catholic faith. Before he came and was a high level mason, both of their parents and grandparents were masons. Should they have a generational, do they have to be worried about a generational curse? Should they pray for some kind of generational exorcism? Should they be concerned about that? That whole notion of generational curses is a, a big topic that's being discussed in the International Association of Exorcists. So it's a worldwide group that I belong to. It's made up of 700 priests and our teams, the people that assist us in the ministry. And that, that notion of a generational curse comes from the book of Exodus, where it says that the sins of the father are passed on to the third and fourth generation. But it also says that the blessings are passed on to the thousandth generation. Amen. We also have to remember in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, it says that that used to be the case that children bore the sins of their fathers, but that's no longer true. Everyone is now responsible for their own actions. So the question is really being debated, is the sins of those who have gone before us, if somebody's great-great-grandfather was a Mason, for example, does that mean that we're just, you know, trapped in sin because of what they did? Uh, that's kind of a stretch, because if you think about it, if baptism can wash away original sin, but it can't cleanse the fact that somebody's great-grandfather was a Mason, that's not very good theology to stand on. But to me, there's a difference between saying the sin of one of our ancestors becomes ours now, like a family member that was a Mason. The sin may not become ours, but we can be impacted. We can suffer because of what they did. It would be like somebody growing up in an alcoholic home. You know, you may not be drinking, but because of what somebody else did, it can affect you indirectly. So that's really kind of the debate that's taking place right now in the International Association of Exorcists. It's one thing to say that the sins of those who came before us becomes our own. It's another thing to say that their sin can impact us. And that's what's really being you know, debated right now. Certainly, we're all impacted by original sin, but we have baptism that cleanses, cleanses of us of that sin. But there's still a reality of sin that's around us because of our free will and how we use that. So I would say it's still being debated, but my personal belief, the priest who trained me, the priest who uh, worked with Father Gabriel Amorth, the former chief exorcist in Rome, uh, his father, his name was Father Candido Amentini. He, he's really the one who brought exorcism back into the modern era, if you will. 
And uh, he did not believe in generational curses. He believed that people could be impacted by the sins of others, but he didn't want to say that their sins become our sins. That makes that makes more sense to me. I think I agree with that theology. Um, now, I have a lot more that we're not going to be able to get to, <laughs> but I did just want to uh, ask your opinion on this verse uh, in Second uh, Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter twelve. Uh, verse 7, and to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, a thought was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Now, I've heard a lot in, you know, I haven't heard that really taught much in the Catholic Church, but when I was an evangelical, a lot of ministers would, would try and guess what the thorn in the flesh was. Was it a handicap? Was he blind? And I was like, I'd be in the pew saying, it's telling you right there, it's a, it's a demon. It's a, it's a messenger of Satan. Um, am I correct? Number one, it's a literal demon that Paul's talking about that's harassing him. Am I correct in assuming that? That's how I would interpret that passage. He's very clear. And I would say that that's a form of what I call demonic oppression. So there's four types of extraordinary demonic activity. Possession, which we've talked about a lot. There can be demonic obsession, which are mental attacks. There can be demonic vexation, which are physical attacks. And then demonic infestation, the presence of evil in the location. But there is something called demonic oppression. And it's a gift from God. <laughs> if you can imagine that. But God is allowing somebody to be tormented by a demon as an opportunity for that person to show their fidelity to God. So St. Paul, the thorn in his flesh, the messenger from Satan, sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. Think of Job in the Old Testament, who God permits the devil to afflict him. Job didn't do anything wrong. You know, there's Job. He's, he's lost everything. He's covered in sores. He's got put on sackcloth, he's sitting in ashes, and you know he's told, curse God and die. And what does Job do? He beats his breast and says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of God. Meaning, if things be bad, I glorify God. If they be good, I glorify God. My personal circumstances mean nothing when it comes to God's rightful place in my life. There's great saints in the church. Padre Pio suffered demonic oppression. God permitted the devil to afflict him. Because if you think about it, if somebody is a really holy man or woman, you know, the devil is going to try to afflict them, if God permits, to try to trip the person up. Because, you know, again, it's easy to glorify God when everything is going great. But you really show your true colors when you glorify God when perhaps life is not so great. Amen. And what happened to Job? He stood his ground, he glorified God, and then God blessed him beyond ways that we can even imagine. And when we remain faithful to God, God's gonna bless us in ways that we can't even imagine. May not be in this life. Think of the, the um, you know, Lazarus and the rich man. You know, it may, our reward is in heaven, it could be. But again, we honor and glorify God. We got nothing to worry about. But there is something called demonic oppression. And I define that as a gift from God. God allows a demon to torment us as an opportunity for us to grow in holiness and virtue. I've never heard it put as a gift, uh, but it makes perfect sense. And, you know, St. Paul said it kept him from basically from being conceited. And like you said, uh, the Father told you, once you start thinking it's you that's beating up the demons, then you're in trouble. And so it is a gift if it keeps us humble. And uh, so I definitely see what you're saying. And didn't um, Jesus tell Peter that he was going to allow uh, Satan to sift him? Wouldn't that kind of be the same? The same Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. So what you're saying makes total biblical sense. I've just never heard it saying as a gift, and now I'm going to have to remember that because sometimes you feel like you, you you think you're doing everything right, but you just feel oppressed and say, "Praise the Lord! It's a gift from God." Yeah, it may and not the see thing the is, and the interesting thing about oppression, the devil is doing something that he thinks is going to destroy you or weaken your commitment to God. And it does the exact opposite. 
Every time the devil does something that he believes is advancing his kingdom, he always ends up advancing the kingdom of God. So there he's afflicting, you know, you know, St. Paul. But what happens? Paul's even more firmly convinced in his, his faith. You know, they you think of the moment Jesus is being crucified and the moment that the devil believes that he's won becomes the moment of his defeat. Everything that he was doing that, that led up to the crucifixion, the devil's ready to say, I've won. And then God says, you've lost. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. I think that's, uh, that's a great note we, uh, we can close on. I thank you, Father. This was a very encouraging uh, message. And uh, I think people are going to be surprised. I'm going to upload it tonight. And, uh, you know, we're not doing it live, so they'll see it either late tonight or tomorrow morning. But I think they're going to be surprised at the encouragement the love and the grace that came from you. And I just want to say thank you. Oh, yeah, uh, that's, my what, pleasure. that's what the world needs. That's what the church needs. And uh, again, thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to have Nick come and hit this because I'm not real good on the computer. <laughs> so if you want to sign off, uh, you know. All right. Kind of well, again, it's, it's been good to talk with you and hopefully it'll help your viewers. Uh, for your listeners and just to be able to recognize the power of God. Yeah. And really that's what it is. It's about not focusing on the devil, but focusing on God. And when our focus is on God, we, we have nothing to fear. That's awesome. And I that's think a- that's really, cause some people are always surprised that I'm willing to talk about the topic, but I believe that the more we keep it in secret, somehow we're, we're giving power to the devil. You're right. But when we, when we talk about it and the importance of faith, we're dragging the devil out into the light, which is where he doesn't want to be. And a good analogy I like to share with people is, you know, if a house is infested with, with bugs, you turn a light on, what happens to the bugs? They, they run. crawl for every crack and crevice. They want to get out of the light. And when people are dealing with the demonic, the church wants to throw the light of Jesus Christ on that person. And when that happens, the demons are going to crawl for every crack and crevice they can find and get the heck out of there. Amen. Amen. I'm going to keep the tape rolling. <laughs> We're just going to be on. <laughs> I could talk to you for hours, Father. I, I really appreciate it. It was uh, such a blessing you taking my call and then coming on. And I know you're a super busy man, but whenever you want to come on, you just let me know. And uh, there was so much more. I wanted to talk about all four of the extraordinary activities of the devil. And we really only got to one. So maybe if you have time in the future, we could talk about the other three and really get into like a deep study of the scriptures. Uh, Cause uh, when you told me um, you were doing a Bible study on Wednesday nights, I think you said your Bible study. I was like, wow, yeah. <laughs> this, this is awesome. This guy. And, and, and your book is just littered with scripture. And that's, that was another thing that I just couldn't, honestly, uh, I just couldn't put your book down. I just, mm-hmm. like I said, you know, I went to work exhausted the next day because of you. <laughs> and I, I tried to write the book in, in a manner that's easy to read. It was very, that, you, that, you that was my goal. You, you totally accomplished your goal. You absolutely did. So I'm going to tell everybody about it. And uh, Well, let me know read. what type of reaction you get from the uh, the broadcast and Okay. Based on that, it'll guide us to perhaps another conversation soon. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and you have a good night, and uh, God bless. All right, Rob. You take care. God bless you as well. Bye.